Let's podcast. No Joe Giglio today. It is a travel day for the Giglio family. They're coming back from the Final Four in Phoenix. I'm Joe Ovias inside Eford Studios. Thanks to Empire Properties and thanks to Copiers Plus. Check them out online at copiers-plus.com. Get that print assessment. Move your documents to the cloud. Save money. Find out how you can do it by going to copiers-plus.com. Without Gilio here, it's a bit of a friends of the podcast sort of day. West Durham, ESPN, ACC Network will drop on by. Uh, Mitch Northrum, who's been helping us talk about women's college hoops, he'll be on. Luke Takaka, the News and Observer. Kate Rogerson of ABC 11. She did the double. Cleveland, Phoenix. How tired is she? We'll catch up with her in a little bit. I did want to start today's show, though, going back to Saturday and doing the after dark. And it's funny. I knew it was going to be a technological challenge. I was praying to the cell phone tower gods. I needed that 5G to be hidden. It wasn't quite hidden. It's fine. We made it work. I know some of you appreciate the DIY nature of this podcast. Salute to y'all. Um, but part of my issue with Saturday was I think I was trying to do a little too much. I wanted to take in what was going on on Hillsborough Street. I wanted to take in what was going on in downtown Raleigh because you just haven't seen this with NC State you just, in basketball. You just haven't seen it. I mean, it's been 41 years. So I wanted to see what it was like around town while everybody was getting ready to and then obviously watch the Final Four. So I ended up at Mitch's. Uh, they had closed off the block in front of Mitch's Tavern. I know they had some te technical difficulties to get things going, to get the game on television. But once things got going, everybody was having a good time. I got there probably two hours before tip-off as the crowd was gathering. It was a lot of fun. But the problem was between kind of taking things in, taking pictures, doing some stuff for social media, taking a lime scooter back to downtown Raleigh, watch the second half in uh, in in the Raleigh Times, it was it was a little bit of a herky jerky watching experience for me uh, for NC State Purdue. So I went and I watched the first half again, and I, I, the reason why I went back and I watched is because the, the general sentiment for NC State was they missed a bunch of shots. Yes, they did miss a bunch of shots, but the thing that I immediately took away in the first half, and I know it's something that Gilio had tweeted out, but it was fairly obvious with the way that the game, the way that the game started was NC State had played a very specific way throughout this entire run, and they benefited by having everybody on the court. Even Mo Diara, who with Ramadan has been a storyline, and they made it work. I mean, an incredible amount of credit goes to him, the coaching staff, the trainers for making this work, and him, him never really looking tired. But the timing didn't necessarily work out on Saturday for Mo Diara. The whistle didn't necessarily work out for NC State. That's one consistency that we've talked about through this entire run, that NC State has had a friendly whistle. You know, we joke about NC State stuff being dead, right? And then when there was a call reversal at one point, when did you ever see that? And it allowed, and this is important because it allowed DJ Burns to play his game. Joe likes to use that phrase, starting out on time, playing with a sense of desperation. Things got stopped up early with an early foul for DJ Burns. And of course, you throw in the Mike O'Connell injury and NC State's first half was not what you had seen throughout this entire run. But good teams, elite teams, teams that have the eye on the championship can find different ways to win. And ultimately, I think that's what Purdue did better than NC State. Now, there's what Purdue was built to do this season and going out and executing it, playing for a national championship. And then there was the surprise of NC State as an 11 seed being in this situation given the record that they had had during the regular season, given the conversations about them leading into the ACC tournament. So for NC State, I think most people understood they had to play a perfect game. They had to make sure that everything that had been going right for them all throughout this run was going to continue to go right for them in this game. And it didn't. It just straight up didn't. But all that being said, I thought NC State did the best that they could to keep that game within arm's length. I mean, they were within six at halftime. But DJ Burns was never really able to get going. I think a lot of that credit goes to Purdue. Michael Connell being off the court, takes a guard off the court, puts other guys in situations. I know Breon Pass had a little bit of moment there, but it was a lot on DJ Horn, who I think did a good enough job to keep NC State in it. There was one other thing about the reaction to the loss. 
that I did want to push back on a little bit, and that is Zach Eady. Zach Eady did not have the type of game that people wanted or expected or some like elite level game. I think NC State had something to do with that. Uh, they made life difficult for Purdue by executing a defensive game plan that has been consistent with NC State throughout this entire run. They forced Purdue to start their offense a little further out than they wanted to. They put Zach Eady in a position where he had to put the ball on the floor, which can be a little bit of an adventure, and that played out. But Zach Eady did hit big shots when it was necessary. He certainly hit some big shots early on to give Purdue that life, that momentum. And I also thought that Zach Eady altered the game defensively, not necessarily when it comes to physically blocking shots, but he's a big dude you got to work around. And that factors in. And all that piles together for 50 points. It's not any one thing. It all just kind of piles together, and that's the result that you end up with. But to me, you know, with, with Edie, I mean, the rebounds, I mean, I even get that into the part where the rebounds, I mean, Purdue had 30 defensive rebounds in this game. So a lot of credit goes to them. A lot of a lot of credit goes to NC State for getting in this situation and keeping it somewhat competitive up until a moment in the second half where shots really were not going in. And Purdue, for as much as NC State had done a good job defensively, they finally started to hit some big shots. And Kevin Keats talked about that in the post-game press conference about their game plan, executing the game plan, basketball being a make-or-miss game. You know, I thought we had a great game plan coming in. Um, I thought they made some shots. And um, I think one of the... Our biggest difference is some of the shots that we normally make, uh, we didn't make in the in the game, and, and certainly um, kind of got away from us a little bit. But I don't know that I could be more prouder of uh, a group of men that I've ever coached in my life. Um, adversity, you name it. Um, situations, you name it. Hard times, you name it. And they found a way to win the ACC. They found a way to make it to the Final Four. And so we're going to we're going to leave out of here because Purdue won the game, but we will walk out of here with our heads up as champions and, um, you know, what we've been able to provide and um, the memories that these guys have um, created for NC State basketball, but more importantly for themselves, for the rest of their lives. And um, these guys are champions, they're ACC champions, and so I'm proud of them, you know, starting with the older guys, um, DJ Burns and DJ Horn and Casey Morsell and, I'm um, just so proud of what they have poured into this university and also into our basketball uh, program. So um, grateful for them. Um, excited that, you know, what we've done and what they've been able to do. And um, like I said, we're going to leave out here, you know, with our heads up. Keats was then asked about this run, the impact on him, the impact on NC State as a program, and what they're going to do going forward. We, we have a story and when you're when you're in any sports, you want to have a story. Look at our story. I mean, this is the way this story was written was unbelievable because we've had in, in order to win any championships, you got to have highs and lows. We started the season with great highs. In the middle, there were some lows, um, but equally some highs. Then and then at the end, regular season, there were lows. But look look what would this that this team was able to accomplish. Um, I I sit back and. I just don't know how you can win nine elimination games. And um, I think all of those nine games, we only had one of them that was um, not a double-digit when we got in the NCAA tournament. There wasn't a double-digit win. And these guys always believed they trusted. Even when we didn't have any, uh, we wasn't having success, you know, they believed in me. They believed in the staff. And um, they stuck together and they shut out all the outside noise with, you know, the internet and everything else and, and came out as champions. Yeah. So that comment from Kevin Keats kind of gets me to a jumping off point, wrapping up my thoughts on NC State this run. And I don't think the processing, I said it after the ACC tournament championship that I don't think we've had proper time to process what that championship means for NC State in the grand scheme. Just like I don't think we have had enough time to process what this final four run means on a variety of different levels. Some of it might not, it might not work out some of it, but just might not work out. This just might be a once in a lifetime situation that happened. That's a nature of college basketball. Now, thanks to the transfer portal NIL rosters changing from year to year, right? There's, there's all sorts of ways to unpack this, but I did get a tweet from a fan. This is from Kyle, a uh, listener to the podcast 
who says, you know, if NC State fans seem not to appreciate the run right now as much as you think they they ought to, it's probably because so many saw this as a once in a 40 year opportunity to get a natty and don't know when the next chance will come. Final Four is definitely an accomplishment, though. Yes. And I would say, to be fair, if you don't hang out online all the time, most people are really appreciative of what happened. And as Kevin Keats said, there is a story. There's a reason why we had fun with the feels like 24. 24 is a story. 24 is going to be a, a point that so many people are going to remember and talk about all the memories that are made from that. So I think for the most part, 99% of people appreciate what this run was all about and, and understand that getting to the final four is an accomplishment in and of itself. Are they disappointed they lost the game? Of course they're disappointed and they lost the game, but that's sports. Only one of these teams is going to win, right? And if winning was easy, <laughs> then you wouldn't feel the way that you feel about this kind of stuff. And I think that's you know kind of the reason why I wanted to hang back, as I said at the start of this podcast today. Like part of the reason why I wanted to hang back is because I've never really seen like this stuff on Hillsborough Street before. Now we're here in downtown Raleigh. I hyped, I I hopped on a lime scooter and it was cool going down Hillsborough Street on the lime, going past Players Retreat. I had never seen a line like that for Players Retreat before, right? Uh, there's a bar where the old Snoopies used to be. It was packed shoulder to shoulder with people watching on a big screen TV. I forgot the name of the bar, but it's where these Snoopies used to be. And then I got to Mitch's, ran into Lumpy. Uh, he was there as I was zooming by. He was taking a picture of the bell tower. I kind of surprised him, you know, as I pulled up on the lime. Yeah. <laughs> and when I got to uh, when I got to Mitch's himself, run into people that are the listeners, people that I know I haven't seen in a while, posting up with neighbor Rick to watch the game. That was a good time, right? I mean, that's what ultimately it's about. Go outside, touch grass, drink a beer, watch the game. And that's what that was a lot of fun for me. It was a lot of fun for everybody there. Housekeeping. Housekeeping brought to you by Enovana. Check them out online at E-N-O-V-A-N-A dot com. If you have mess inside your mansion or trash in your cabana, get it green, clean with Enovana. Bud with the absolute banger of a jingle for Enovana. They came out to the house last week, did a great job. They'll be back next week. I got them on a two-week rotation. Maybe you're just looking for a one-time cleaning. You're looking for the spring cleaning, right? It's that time of the year. Basketball's wrapped up. You're getting ready for the playoffs. You want to get a head start on just getting rid of old stuff, but you don't, you're kind of overwhelmed. Well, Enovana can help. So check them out online at enovana.com. We got the birthday party coming up. The OG birthday party is going to be at Shady's on May 3rd. We're going to have a variety of things to raffle away. Ken has been gracious, gracious enough to give us bourbon, some, some high-level bourbon. So we're going to raffle that off. We got a DJ Jarvie, a Seth Jarvis mixtape that we made last summer that can get you ready for this summer and the playoffs. And I'm pretty sure that Jillio is going to raffle off one of the cardboard signs. I think the Duke sign stayed in Phoenix. I think the UNC sign is coming back signed. That'll be something that'll be raffled off as well. So again, that's going to be May 3rd at Shady's. We're going to have trivia. It's going to be a lot of fun. We'll give you more details as uh, the weeks go along. Also, part of the housekeeping is we like to keep you up to date with what's going on, right? So what we do on this podcast, you know, to keep it mostly free, if not all free right now, is that we have a lot of great sponsors. And we've had some sponsors come on from the jump to help us out to get going. And we've had sponsors that have stuck with us this entire time. We've had some sponsors that make sense for uh, the the season, right? So like Homefield. Homefield did a great job with us, and we appreciate them from football season to basketball season. So one of our new corporate champions is Nature's Relief. They've been a guest on 919 Vice a couple of times. Great people, great products, great customer service. And you can check them out online at naturesreliefhempstore.com. Relief, by the way, is spelled R-E-L-E-A-F. Get it? Leaf. Relief. So that's naturesreliefhempstore.com. They've got five locations across the triangle, two in Raleigh, including a new spot on Western Boulevard. It's open right now, but they're going to have a big grand opening event on 420. You see what they did there. Now, if you're curious about hemp products, go to the website. They actually have a way to personalize what you do. Uh, so if you're not sure where to start, you can get your results with this questionnaire. If you're somebody that knows this 
category of hemp, but you want to discover some new products, again, that personal survey can go a long way. For me, it's funny. It's like when it, when it comes to this stuff, you, you think you have an idea, but there are so many different ways in which you can go with hemp and hemp-related products uh, that can help for a variety of things. And again, it's all natural. So for me, it was sleep. It's not that I can't sleep. I'm just not getting a deep sleep, a consistent deep sleep. They have products for that. Uh, you know me. I've been into the seltzers, right? Trying to get away from beer, find other ways to just kind of chill. That is another thing they have a lot of at Nature's Relief. So go check them out, naturesreliefhempstore.com. That's R-E-L-E-A-F, okay? Relief. So we thank them for jumping on. We'll tell you more about them as the week goes on. But more importantly, go check out their grand opening extravaganza on 420. Also want to thank Roback for jumping on. We talked about them a little bit on Saturday night during the after dark. Uh, Roback.com. You can use the promo code OG20. I, I kind of joke that Roback is the store specifically designed for Joe Giglio. I'm pulling it up on YouTube. You can look at these printed polos. All these patterns, these floral patterns, the stripes uh, as well. Can you not see Giglio wearing these, these polos? Look at these things. They're amazing. Uh, they also have joggers, shorts, etc. I'm actually going to jump on some shorts here relatively soon because uh, it is about to be skies out, thighs out in the Ovius house. So check out Roback.com. Use that promo code OG20 to save 20% off your order. It is golf time. You got the Masters coming up this week. Uh, you're going to be spending some more time outside. You got to look fresh. Roback.com is the place to go. Joining us on the Easter Automotive Group hotline, he is Wes Durham, ESPN, ACC Network, voice of the Atlanta Falcons, and joining us, Mike Gray style in the car. Well, remember the old Packer and Durham show where in, invariably Mike Bray used to do all of his segments from a Buick? Do you remember that? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Remember one time he did it and there was like a laundry basket sitting like right there. Oh, Bray, Bray was always my guy because he exuded oh. dad energy like no other yeah. coach in the ACC, right down to his outfits when um, when they got away from wearing suits and everything else. Yeah. Let, well, I didn't have a school drop off this morning. I stopped to get a Dunkin' Donuts coffee in Flowery Branch, Georgia. And I'm wearing my gear here because I'm working on a project today at the Falcons complex uh, for the next couple of weeks. Uh, it it'll air down the road here, okay. but it's uh, one of those things that you have to do, quote, off season. You're always cooking, man. You're always cooking. I mean, <laughs> the college basketball season just wrapped up in the triangle. Ooh. But I know that the sun was rising just over PNC Arena with Rod Brindamore's big giant head because we're about to go into hockey mode. You're, you're going to be going yeah. into football mode uh, with the draft right around the corner. But we're still in the coaching carousel mode mm -hmm. because I woke up this morning and I had to double check on the date that it wasn't April 1st. <laughs> I was getting duped by this. And John Calipari is leaving yeah. Kentucky for mm -hmm. Arkansas. Last time I checked on that situation, yeah, I'd listened to Gary Parrish and Matt Norlander on the CBS Ion College Basketball Podcast. And the way that they had positioned it was these two entities are stuck with each other. John right. Calipari, like where else is John Calipari going to coach? And what kind of coach is really going to come to Kentucky? The buyout was insane. And whether mm -hmm. you and your AD get along is immaterial to the point. You, you're going to have to make it work one way or the other. But it looks like John Calipari is like, no, I, I don't want to make it work here anymore. I don't like this situation anymore. So he's off to Arkansas. And I believe the chicken tenders that my kids like at Wegmans, the price of the brick just went up to make sure that that Tyson NIL money is going to work out for John Calipari at Arkansas. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, go look up the Tyson family and go look up at Arkansas and you see where this comes together. But there's an ACC hook here, Wes. There's an ACC hook. John, Cal John Calipari could have been in the ACC had he taken that NC State job years ago. Oh, oh my but, God. But SMU is about to join the ACC. So they moved on from what Rob Lanier, who had been there the mm -hmm. last two years, and they decided... Boom. Two whole years. Two whole years. Okay, two whole years. So SMU's looking at this going, well, damn it. We got to we gotta up our game a little bit if we're going to go into the ACC next season. So they go and get mm -hmm. Andy Enfield, who was the hot coaching commodity after his uh, Florida Gulf Coast run. He was at Southern Cal. So then right. Cal opens up, 
you get Eric Musselman to leave Arkansas to take that Southern Cal job. And mm -hmm. with the Arkansas job now open, John Calipari is taking that gig. And initially I go, damn, that's wild. Like of all the jobs to take. But when mm -hmm. you start getting behind the scenes and you start looking at the connections and you kind of look at where things were, were at in Kentucky, I guess it makes a little bit of sense that he's actually leaving for Arkansas. I think it does, Joe. I think the what the one in three in the last however many NCAA tournaments, right? I think yeah. that has something to do with it. I think there's an element of, um, you know, my wife Vicky has an analogy sometimes that you, the minister stays too long and the message becomes numb to the yeah to the members of the congregation. Yeah. And we we saw again the other ACC connection and going tying it back to NC State. Kentucky mm -hmm. is part of NC State's bracket luck, getting bounced yeah. by Oakland to open things up for the Wolfpack. Yeah, exactly. So when you look at it, Calipari's probably done all he can do at UK. Um, and and he's doing Mitch Barnard a favor. Yes. Um, number one, Arkansas, Hunter Juracek does not have to pay a buyout. Now, Southern Cal, I think, had to pay a bit of a buyout to get Eric Musselman. I'm mm -hmm. not sure on the details of that one. Um, but I, I think John Calipari and Saving Mitch Barnard, what thirty some million dollars is that the is that the rate I read? <laughs> it was something um, ridiculous like that, right? I mean, it's half a Jimbo Fisher, so congratulations. Um, uh, but the idea to me is is that John Calipari had, and I read this. Uh, Mark Ennis, I think, tweeted it. Rick Bosich followed up on it, and then I read uh, a note. I think John Clay had said something about it, and then I read Norlander and some of those other guys on Twitter this morning saying that. Um, there's a Tyson family relationship with Calipari already. Um, and that Hunter Yurichek, who, uh, by the way, I think worked at Wake Forest under Ron Wellman years ago. Oh, geez. Okay. Um, Hunter Yurichek obviously wanted to put something together here to capitalize. Arkansas was in shambles by the end of last year. They were far from the team that beat Duke in the ACC SEC challenge. Mm -hmm. By the end of the year, Arkansas was just up for grabs. And I, I think that they need something to rally with, to be honest with you, because football right now in Fayetteville has become the great unknown. And let's be honest, Calipari wants one last ride, and it's going to be in the college game. He's, uh, I, I like John from what I know about him at the time. I just saw him when I did Louisville in Kentucky in December. I've always had a, a nice relationship with him. I wouldn't say we're friends by any stretch of the imagination, but I always felt like he needed one last ride, and the question was going to be, where is it going to be, right? Mm -hmm. And, and it's going to be in Fayetteville, Arkansas, in a league that he knows with a program that's got to get better if it wants to stay in stride with the arrival of Oklahoma and Texas and obviously the, the transitional piece there. The funny part for me, and you mentioned Andy Enfield. Andy Enfield kind of helps solidify a little bit of what we're getting ready to see in the ACC. And I believe, now this is, you know, some would say, well, you're flying the flag here. Maybe so. But I think the ACC now has crossed the bridge of Roy, K and Bayheim. Okay? You've gotten John Shire through two, Hubert Davis through three, uh, Red Autry's off and running, playing in the portal now, you know, guys coming in, coming out, whatever the case may be, right? It, it feels like, you know, there's the Laranega Leonard Hamilton piece out there, Joe. But Pat Kelsey now, that's, that's, an, that's an igniter. That's mm -hmm. an igniter hire, right? Um, you start to see kind of the runoff of Pat Kelsey. You start to see the emergence of some of this other stuff taking place. I think it's going to get really interesting in the ACC because I think they're bringing guys in here now and, and give Kevin a lot of credit. In the span of three weeks, it takes most guys two years maybe to flip this thing. Kevin flipped the whole thing in three weeks. And now yeah. NC State has kind of regenerated its own momentum, right? Win the ACC tournament, go to the Final Four, I thought you were playing with house money from Oakland on, but hey, nonetheless here, I, I think NC State now has a little bit of traction with the state Carolina Duke triumphant. And then you had what Forbes has done at Wake and Brownell going to the Elite Eight. I'm not I'm not killing off the ACC on this. I no. now we gotta get that we gotta get some maintenance done. We gotta figure out the 18 and the 20 thing and how it works toward this, you know, if we're gonna keep buying net stock, we gotta figure out how that works. But outside of the uh of the landscape pieces with coaches, I, I think this league turned out okay a little bit. Yeah, it's it's funny. You're, you're, you're talking about things and, and Kevin Keats. Kevin Keats does have the chance to do the funniest thing with Rob Dillingham, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. as things have sure does. Kentucky. 
And if you want to keep that thing going, and if you've got interest from NC State, and we understand that NIL is the thing that you need to keep these things going, I mean, that's kind mm-hmm. of the piece for, for Calipari to go to Arkansas. State does have the chance to do the funniest things. So does Coach K. Maybe he comes out of retirement, he goes to Kentucky. Yeah, okay, right. No, no. Sure. actually, what about Rick Patino? He always said he wanted his biggest regret. What was Rick Patino's biggest regret? Leaving Kentucky to go coach the Knicks, or no, go coach the Celtics, yeah. So he has a chance to go back and, and write things. Actually, the funniest thing would have been with the Louisville job open if Calipari had left for Louisville. Now that, that. Well, let me ask you this. Is Kenny Payne on John Calipari's staff at, at Arkansas? Um, I, oh, we're such good friends. I love Kenny Payne. Da, da, da. The whole bit he fed you in December after they beat him by 30 some. Yeah, I don't know, man. After, after the two okay, years. player. I don't okay. know. I don't know what Kenny Payne does after after the last two years. Well, I know one thing he does. He gets paid. Oh yeah, there is that. There is that. Yeah. One other note about Kentucky, but before we move back to the ACC, who, who does actually take that job? Because to me, what's happening at Kentucky is not dissimilar to the conversations we had at Duke and what happens next after Coach K. It's not that dissimilar to Carolina, who's been through this before. Uh, There's no obvious choice like Roy Williams coming back to coach North Carolina. So what direction do you go in? Do you put your trust in Hubert Davis? You know, there's been some mixed results, but for the most part, three years in, you you can see why Roy Williams believed in Hubert Davis. But And there's expectations at Duke and at Carolina, but the expectations at Kentucky are at another level. Right. And I'm really curious with how college basketball has been flattened through name, image, and likeness in the transfer portal how they evolve. Because that was one thing that Calipari just never really got away from. So how do they evolve as a program? That's a good question. I, I, You know, to me, and I was thinking about this a little bit last night as I was reading through some of these um, Twitter posts, right? Yeah. The the first guy I would call, and I don't think he'll take the job, but if I'm Mitch Barnhart, the first guy I want to check the temperature of is Billy Donovan. He's already said no twice. I know he has. Make him say no a third time. All right. But, Beyond that, I mean, okay, go take the flavor of the month. I mean, remember Porter Moser rode Loyola to the Oklahoma job? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's what I'm saying about college basketball. The job right now is so hard to go in and take a program like Kentucky where you got a bag of money and you got to get recruits. And, oh, by the way, there's this mammoth expectation, right? I mean, think about how how arduous that task is. And that's why, in many ways, Duke and Carolina were very fortunate to have in-house candidates who could kind of appease some of the concern and yet continue the momentum of the current legendary administration that was there. Now, you're going to have some bumps, and Hubert and John have seen those bumps. But at the same time, Joe, you at least have some degree of confidence that the momentum is not going to start or stop and start under a new head coach from outside. I don't know that Kentucky has that candidate. That's the concern that I would share with most of the Wildcat fans this morning. Do you have somebody who understands the legacy of your program, the momentum of your program, the recruiting prowess of your program? I mean, you can't hire Bruiser Flint. You can't hire Orlando Antigua to take over the Kentucky program. It just doesn't work that way. No. But who are you going to hire? It's Billy be, Donovan, it's gonna Billy be Donovan, Rick it's Pitino. Gonna be, it's going to be something. We, it's like it's kind of like what happened to Alabama, right? There was all the obvious names that people thought were going to go to Alabama, and it ends up being with DeBoer. Um, I could say Kalen DeBoer. Yeah, I mean, sure, that's DeBoer. possible, but I mean, who do you take of the elite eight coaches? Let's say right now, the elite eight. Yeah. Is there an elite eight guy you would say, I want that guy to go coach Kentucky? I don't know that. No. No, not guys who are established at their spots and have no reason to leave. Is Kevin Keats a candidate at Kentucky? There's one for you. No, no, no. Just saying. No, I don't. uh, I don't see that happen. Plus, if you're if if you're Kevin Keats, that's the other aspect of it too. If you're Kevin Keats, if you thought uh, if you thought NC State was a bit of a tough neighborhood, the conversation about you going into the ACC tournament. What do you think it's going to be like when you get to Kentucky? I mean, I okay, love so, you're securing so, the bag, which is fine. I, I understand that. You right. Know, eight, I get that. But come on. But, okay, Joe, but then take the Rick Barnes leaving Texas to go to Tennessee analogy. 
Yeah. Is there that coach out there for, for Mitch Barnhart? I could see Chris Beard doing that already. You know, as the Chris Beard rehabilitation tour happens at Ole Miss, I know he was in the running for the Arkansas job for like a hot minute. Um, what about Will Wade? <laughs> what the hell? I mean, seriously. No, nah, man, I see where you're at. I see where you're Why at. Why not? I see where you're at. I see, I see <laughs> what's going on here. Now, it's we'll, we'll, we'll close on this because I do think okay. we'll, we'll close on this as it relates to, we'll get back to your point about the coaches in the ACC. Okay. Because I do think there's a mistake being made with how we talk about the conference and the narratives mm -hmm. around the conference. And I commend Jim Phillips, commissioner of the ACC, uh, from the ACC tournament on going out of his way to do some media, going out of his way to join Mark Packer and Taylor Tannenbaum to talk about the state of the league mm -hmm. and you know how they want to change that conversation. I get all those types of things. But to me, the conversation changes on the ground level. And maybe I'm guilty of taking in way too much college basketball media, but it's fairly clear that access matters. Being a guy who talks to national guys helps change the conversation yeah. around your league. You know, all those coaches that you mentioned, the one that you didn't is somebody like Jeff Capel, who's doing a very, very good job at Pitt and actually goes out and he advocates for the league. Mm -hmm. Absolutely advocates for the league. So I'm curious if this new batch of guys that's coming in on the ground level changes the conversation by talking to those who help change the narrative the ones who actually set the table for the conversation. I am not one of those people. I am just a lowly podcaster, okay? That's just how it is. The national guys are the ones who help set the table for the conversation. And you can argue about the net. Let's say that the ACC does kind of figure things out. They go out there and they win the games they're supposed to win. They're in the Ken Palm top three or the top two uh, in terms right. of the best conferences. But you know what the conversation is going to be when that happens, Wes? Oh, well, that's where the ACC should be. They'll get no credit for getting back to that. Mm -hmm. So how do you change it? You change it by playing the game. And I think that's the one lesson that the ACC learn, has learned the last couple of years. You have to play the game if you want to change the conversation, unless you don't care about that mm -hmm. conversation and you let the results speak for themselves. But you can't play it in the middle. Pick one. Either you don't care about what they say or you start playing the game. That's where I'm at right now with the ACC. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good point. I think that, you know, and it's it's interesting during kind of the NCAA tournament and doing a couple of NIT games, I had, I had a long conversation with Steve Forbes about quad three games. <laughs> right. Okay. I mean, I mean, we just talked about you can't play quad three. You can play quad one, quad two, and quad four, but you can't play quad three because they don't do anything for you and they only kill you, right? Mm -hmm. So if again, if we're gonna keep this uh if we're gonna keep the church of the net you know, keep passing the plate, so to speak, and we're going to keep buying into this. That's fine. But tell us the rules. We've now gamed it. We know what it is. You know, don't go change the secret sauce here. Just leave it like it is. Everybody now understands. And, you know, in a couple of years, you'll see schools really struggle to games, non-conference games, in my opinion. But that's neither here nor there. Um, MTEs will be critical. Foreign tours will be critical because every coach will want to have some experience with his team or her team going into the season. So if you can't get on a foreign tour, you're going to try and play some Cosmos exhibition game somewhere that, you know, gives you a feel for two or three teams. Um, but the reality of the ACC is exactly right. The campaign of public relations has to start and it has to start now. And it has to start now for football and now for basketball, because that's what this league is going to have to do because the other two leagues, and we saw it last week with the super league proposal, right? Mm -hmm. The other two leagues, are never going to vote for the Super League. The Super League on paper is a pretty good idea. It's a little crazy. It's got a lot of Premier League soccer and UEFA and all that stuff in it. Yeah, dude, when, but, I saw, when I saw the, the regulation stuff, I'm just like, it's a non-starter for so many American fans, man. It's like that's right. A complete non-starter. But here's the other part. The idea of combining 60 to 70 schools is completely that idea. Mm -hmm. But when you can't get the two top ones to go for it, Big Ten and the SEC, because they got the most in the bank at this point, that's going to be a non-starter. So you got to figure out another plan. Um, it's almost as crazy as talking about an expansion of the college football playoff when you've yet to play a 12-team playoff. <laughs> but the idea of what you're talking about from a public relations standpoint, and again, Joe, let's also recognize, too, you and I have been around long enough. This is a break from ACC personality. 
Yes. The ACC has never go had to never stand out on the bow of the boat and say, this is who we are. This is what we're doing. And we're here to tell you all about it. Um, and I think they have to start doing that. I think it's incumbent upon us at times. And I don't like doing that, as you know, because I think the product ought to sell itself. Yeah, I'm but the at the same way. time, the ridiculousness that gets spewed out there, which is almost kind of the political television debate arena at times, which really frustrates me because this is sports and we're supposed to treat it differently, but it's not. Um, I think the ACC has to take a real stand with its personality and certainly with its coaches. And I agree with you about Capel. I think Forbes is a guy. Brownell's a guy. Keats is a guy. I think Shire and Davis also fall into line with that. Hubert Davis and I think it's not going to play the game. That's the thing. No. Hubert Davis isn't going to play the game. And I'm not, and I, I want to be abundantly clear when I say this, it's fine. It, it's right. perfectly fine. Not everybody wants to, not everybody should. I think mm -hmm. Shire wants to, but Shire just hasn't done enough at Duke yet to be taken as somebody that, I agree with that. we listen to. Now that could change over time. I think the coaches that you just referenced, the guys who've been doing this for a long time, can help yeah. change that conversation. And I think the other one that you're going to find out is going to be one of those guys is Pat Kelsey. Yes, I totally, totally agree with you on that. That's the guy yeah. I look at as somebody who can help change the conversation around the ACC. Yeah, Pat, Pat Kelsey, uh, knowing Pat from his time as an assistant with Prosser, when Prosser had the uh, rock star staff of Dino Gaudio, Chris Mack, and Pat Kelsey, Whew. I'm going to tell you now, and Skip Prosser during that era, yeah, was a pretty opinionated guy too, and he was, was a welcome opinionated guy. He was, he was, and I think I think that's gonna, and I Mike Young is that guy, but I, I think it's gonna be an interesting. Uh, I think it's gonna be a really interesting era. I want to think we're moving into the new era of ACC basketball through the changes of those legendary coaches we talked about, mm -hmm. but we may need a year or two to validate the fact that we are in the new era. Wes Durham, ESPN, ACC Network. We appreciate the time as always. Have fun doing your project with the... Uh, live, live from a Honda Accord, Joe. You like in Flowery that, Branch, man. Georgia. You like that. Hey, Honda. man. You know, I fly a lot, so I just need good gas mileage back and forth to the airport and that kind of thing. <laughs> That's why I always ride with my Civic. All right, man. We'll talk to you later. Take care. Big thanks to State Farm. Check out Matt Davis, insuregarner.com, voginsurance.com, or call him directly at 919-779-8277. Matt's been sticking with us as a corporate champion for a while now. He's been saving you money. We've been hearing from listeners. They've switched over to Matt Davis, and they're like, whoa, we've, we're saving like on a, a substantial amount on a monthly basis. You can do the same thing if you haven't done it yet uh, as you're kind of doing an assessment. I mentioned spring cleaning earlier. Maybe you're looking at a little spring cleaning for your bank account, looking for ways to save money. Insurance, home auto is a good way to do it. And Matt Davis can do it for you. So check out insuregarner.com, the OG insurance.com, or call 919 779 8277. Also, big thanks to Two Roosters for jumping on. What a time. What a time for our friends at Two Roosters. Uh, Jared had actually texted me earlier today about some of the cool stuff that, that they got coming up, but I, I did want to put uh, a bow on the Tuffy tracks, which they broke out following NC State winning the ACC championship and throughout this entire Final Four run. 798 gallons of Tuffy tracks sold during that run for NC State. Nearly 800 gallons of ice cream. That is insane to me. I love it. Uh, but they got some new stuff coming up right now. It's the Kids Chef menu time and as jared told me they have local elementary school kids submit ice cream flavors and creations for them they pick six of the best ones and they have them at the shops all month and they absolutely love doing this if you know anything about you know my kids are you know i got one who just turned 16 i got another who's turning 13 uh when they were younger they participated in some of these camps and they would come up with all sorts of concoctions my younger son likes to call you know He'll make something up out of, out of nowhere, and he's like, ah, yes, I went full chef. So kids love cooking, and they love it even more when everybody gets to try it. So you know these kids are like rock stars walking around school going, hey, you know my flavor? It's at Two Roosters. So go check it out. TwoRoosters.com for locations across the triangle. Go check out that kid chef menu.
Joining us on the Heaster Automotive Group Hotline, Mitch Northrum, WUNC, NPR, covers women's college basketball uh, in Cleveland. Are you still in Cleveland from yesterday? I am, I am still in Cleveland, uh, still in my hotel room, not quite on the road yet. Okay, okay. Before we talk about what we saw yesterday with South Carolina uh, winning the national championship, let's talk about what South Carolina did to NC State. Uh, that was a competitive game for a half. And then the third quarter happened. It was a series of unfortunate events where, yes, you know South Carolina is legit, but they hit a gear that I guess NC State just couldn't, and it was a wrap from there. Yeah, um, yeah, that first half, super, super com competitive. Um, NC State's guards really playing well. River Baldwin kind of doing everything she can to kind of keep Camilla Cardoso in check. And then at halftime, South Carolina flipped the switch. Um, a 29-6 to run for the Gamecocks in that quarter. Um, and NC State just, just didn't have an answer. South Carolina just kept punching and kept punching and kept punching. And NC State just couldn't swing back. Um, a River Baldwin kind of summed it up best. You know, I mean, Camilla Cardozo is six foot seven, and Ashlyn Watkins is six foot three. And she was like, you know, Camilla hold, holds the ball up there, and I can't reach it. Um, you know, <laughs> just kind of one of those things. Uh, you know, there's I mean, not many. I mean, she's, look, it's, it's very similar to like DJ Burns with Zach Eady, right? He's like, look, man, he, he's a big dude. I mean, yeah. I, I'm a big dude too, but he's a different kind of big. And I guess the same thing played out on Friday. Yeah, yeah, and Camilla Cardozo is going to be a you know a top five pick in the WNBA draft, and um, you know they had Ashlyn Watkins who had I think twenty rebounds, a career high. So they that's South Carolina's thing. Um, you know they just they're bigger than everybody else, and they're also deeper than everybody else. You know they play nine players, and the four players that come off the bench could start for any other Power Five school. Um, and I think that depth allows them to play as aggressive as they do. Cause if somebody gets in foul trouble, okay, well, we have, you know, another starter who can come off the bench and, and play just as well. So, um, yeah, that sort of combination of like size and depth, I think, made them really hard for, as we found out, everyone to handle this year as they yes. went 38 0. Yes, hard for everybody to handle. Before we get to the national championship game, uh, to kind of put a, uh, to, to wrap up NC State's season, I know we talked about this going into the Final Four. This is something that Westmore has been building towards at NC State. It's been a very consistent program uh, throughout his tenure. They've won ACC championships. But it's funny, I, I went back and I watched our last conversation, and, and yeah, they weren't picked to win the league this year. This was not the kind of year that they thought they were going to have. They were supposed to have a good year. It's a competitive ACC. But it is interesting that sometimes the teams you think can get to the final four won't the teams that you expect to be good end up surprising you. And I guess that's what this team was. Yeah. This team was picked to finish eighth in the ACC this year, which is wild. They were unranked in the AP poll to start the season. They beat UConn, they beat Colorado, beat Notre Dame, beat Louisville. You have a really great regular season, come up a little short in the ACC title game. And then, um, as we've talked about before, got a little bit of bracket luck, um, but still had to beat a really good Stanford team and a really good Texas team to get to the Final Four, the first for this program since 1998 when K.I. was on the sidelines. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a great, you know, while they came up short against this awesome South Carolina team, it's a great accomplishment for Wes um, and the program. Mm -hmm. And the good news is, is that besides River Baldwin and Mimi Collins, um, everybody comes back. So, you know, those the kind of core of the guards in the backcourt is I James, Sanaya Rivers, Zoe Brooks, Madison Hayes. They're all due to come back, um, unless something unforeseen happens in the transfer portal, but I don't expect it to. Um, and they're gonna be pretty good again next year. You know, he's got some good recruits coming in. There's some freshmen on the bench who um I think will have bigger roles next year. Um, I think Wes will probably need to go to the portal to find like a veteran big to sort of maximize the potential of this really great group of guards that he has. Um, but if he does that, they're going to be in the mix next year too. All right, let's get to the national championship game and, and South Carolina hitting that other gear was evident in the second quarter of this game. You, you're thinking, all right, Caitlin Clark is having the game. This, this is the legacy game that everybody talks about. She has an amazing first quarter. South Carolina just... Caitlin Clark never really was able to keep keep this thing going. Um, I'm not saying that I went to DraftKings and looked at the live line and took some 
you know, I think at one point South Carolina was plus whatever on the money line. I'm like, give me that, please. Because you knew it wasn't going to last like that. And yeah, so, look, sometimes teams just have it. I, I feel like that way about UConn. You know, props to Purdue, but I feel that way about UConn. The team is mm-hmm. just it. And I think South Carolina, with what Don Staley has been able to build, that's it. I mean, it's as, as simple as that. Yeah, th- there were some people asking me, texting me before the game, um, some relatives and stuff that was like, do you think South Carolina is going to win? Can they cover seven and a half? <laughs> um, and I was like, you know, I actually, I, I think that they will. Um, I just thought, especially after Friday's game where like they just eviscerated NC State in the third quarter, just absolutely zapped them. And um, also on Friday, the way that Caitlin Clark struggled a little bit against UConn, um, I was like, you know, this is a South Carolina team that's very, very motivated. They got ousted by Iowa last year in the Final Four. I just didn't think they were going to allow her to beat them again. Um, and, yeah, in that second quarter, um, they held her to one of six shooting, just three points. They go on a 16-7 to seven run to take mm-hmm. the take the lead back. Um, and they got some really great shooting from, from their bench as well. Tessa Johnson is a freshman. Again, like they just have these players on the bench that could go play for any other Power 5 school. So Tessa Johnson's a freshman, comes off the bench, scores their career high 19 points in, in the national title game, um, you know, to kind of will them over the top. Um, and, yeah, they were just – it got to a point where it was just like, okay, this this is one of the all-time teams. This is inevitable – and I mean, South Carolina, aside from Cardozo, who's going in the draft, they're going to bring everybody back. So they're going to be really good again next year. Well, the, the bringing everybody back and, I, and and we'll close the conversation on this because I thought the way that Don Staley handled the celebration by thanking Caitlin Clark mm-hmm. in that moment. I mean, this is a moment for her. It's a moment for her team, but she also used it as a moment to elevate the game in its entirety. And I thought it was a perfect way to cap off what had been a breakthrough season for women's college basketball on multiple levels. And I know that the hot takes are going to be about, you know, and you and I have talked about this and it does bother me. And you made a very, very good point the last time we talked that just because we talk about the men's game a certain way, doesn't mean we have to talk about the women's game in the same way. It's not the same. It doesn't have to be a one for one. And I thought that it was a recognition that everybody elevated the sport and that's going to continue on. And ultimately, that'll be Caitlin Clark's legacy. It's not a championship. It's not the records. It's not, you know, Big Ten Players of the Year. It's that she helped elevate the sport with a lot of other pieces in women's college basketball to get you monster ratings and general interest. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the the rating for the Iowa-UConn game on Friday night was kind of an example of that. Like, that was sort of a perfect storm. Like, you have this a UConn team that has like this long-standing giant fan base and support for women's college basketball. And then you had Caitlin Clark in Iowa. And what do you get? You get 14.2 million viewers, the most watched women's basketball game on record. And we don't have the figures from yesterday's game yet, but I imagine it topped it because there was a whole lot of people tuning in to just see sort of South Carolina's collective greatness. You know, they don't have a star per se, like Caitlin Clark, but yeah. They have a lot of really good players. Um, And I think, yeah, I think the hope is that sort of the rising tide of Caitlin Clark will continue to sort of lift all boats in women's college basketball. And there's going to be, there's a lot of stars that are coming back next year. Like, you know, you got Juju Watkins out at USC. I think she's going to get sort of, um, you know, part of the reason like Caitlin Clark got sort of the treatment that she got this year is because Fox has this big 10 package. So, you know, they threw Gus Johnson on her games and, had, you know, a second camera following her around. Well, USC is in the Big Ten next year, and Juju Watkins might be kind of the next big star for this game. Um, And then you got Hannah Hildalgo at Notre Dame. Uh, Paige Beckers is coming back. She's going to use her extra year, Um, so she's going to be a star. And then the South Carolina team is just going to be really, really good again. So there's definitely plenty of star power to go around. I think kind of the next thing, you know, to sort of watch for is like, will the Caitlin Clark thing continue in the WNBA? Can she sort of lift the boat in that sport as well in terms of viewership and fandom? I think there's going to be a curiosity level, but there's an attachment to women's college basketball by by the university that is going to draw more interest in my opinion. You know, I agree. I, I think I think there's a there's a baked in there's a baked in fandom to college because of the nature of college and your association and your attachment to the university that you went to. Mm-hmm. So that's always going to help. 
But there, I have seen some interesting conversations from WNBA players saying like, yeah, you know, Caitlin can do this against, against other college players. It's kind of like how we talk about with like certain quarterbacks in college football, right? Where it's like, yeah, you could do that against college competition, but let's see what happens when you have to go up against a real defense. And you could look at it two ways. I saw one opinion that was Caitlin Clark's passing ability was underrated in college. It'll be a benefit to her in the WNBA where she'll have teammates who can actually finish some of those, mm -hmm. some of those assists. Um, but you know, if, it's kind of like the JJ Reddick conversation. If you can shoot, you can shoot, you know, yeah. and, and she can shoot. So I'll be curious to see how it plays out, but I don't think it's a given that she's going to be a success in the WNBA. And I think a lot of, a lot of observers kind of feel the same way. Yeah. I'm also really curious to see if they put her on the U S national team this summer. Mm -hmm. um, I, I kind of think, you know, if it is a goal of the U S national team to sort of be evangelical for women's basketball, you probably should put her on the team just to sort of attract new fans and viewers and people are going to tune in just to watch her and see what she does. But yeah, like you said, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of WNBA veterans and players, uh, Diana Taurasi among them, who yes. I think are eager to check Caitlin Clark. Yes, but I think that's good. That's that yes. is a, that's, that is competition, man. I love that. Absolutely. Love that. And I'm sure Caitlin Clark will do her best to rise to it. Mitch, Hey, man, thanks for your help this year on talking about women's college basketball. Uh, there's so much going on, um, and I do my best to keep up what's going on, but you're, like, embedded in this stuff. You do a great job, and I appreciate your help this year, man. Yeah, anytime, and thanks for having me, and I'm uh, happy to talk about this stuff anytime, and thanks for giving me a platform to do it. Big thanks to Mitch for hanging out with us. And big thanks to Breeze Through. You know we're going to be spending a lot of time at that PNC Arena Breeze Through location as we get ready for the NHL Stanley Cup playoffs. Breeze Through is going to be fueling us with the coffee for sure. Uh, we might even be doing some stuff from the beer cave. And Breeze Through has a food truck. They're going to be helping us out for our OG birthday bash on May 3rd at Shady's. So we appreciate them for sponsoring Ovias and Gilio. Uh, I spent some time outside this weekend doing yard work, and it was so gorgeous. Such an incredibly perfect weekend weather-wise. You, know you know what you're thinking. Grilling time. Now is the time. So head on over to Butcher's Market. Check out their locations across the Triangle. Two locations out in Wilmington. And they have incredible selections, various cuts of meats. And my personal favorite aspect of the butcher's market is they make it super, super simple with their marinades. The signature steak tips, you can never go wrong, but they have a variety of different marinades that go with it. You can just go to the case and they got some prepackaged ones, or you can get it specific to what you need. You need two pounds? Good. Here's two pounds for you. Uh, they also have great burgers, hot dogs, and the like. Don't sleep on the wings, by the way. Don't sleep on the wings. So check them out, thebutchersmarkets.com. Joining us on the Heaster Automotive Group Hotline, Luke DeCock, columnist, news and observer. You're at the Media Hotel in Phoenix. Uh, you're still there for the national championship game, but I'm, I'm assuming that the buzz in that Media Hotel is all about John Calipari right now, right? Of course, yeah. And and future Kentucky basketball coach, Matt Canada. So, <laughs> nah, dude. I, I joked with this uh, with West Durham. Coach K has a chance to do the funniest thing if you if you really think about it. I, yeah, I, I, I'm disappointed that we didn't get. And this was a joke I made in Pittsburgh. Similar, you know, on the, in the same note, I'm really disappointed we didn't get Louisville coach John Calipari. I thought that would have been the single funniest outcome of all of this. Uh, but yeah, no. I mean, there's a lot of people do right, like Patino. Um, you know, I mean, that, that Nate Oates and his $18 million buyout, like the dude just signed that contract like three weeks ago and now he wants out of it. But you know what? The transfer portal is insane. We need guardrails on this stuff. We can't have coaches jumping right after signing big bonus deals. Uh, it's not good for the game. People don't want to see that. They don't want to watch these coaches jumping from team. To oh, wait. What are we talking about again? Although I do think there should be a calendar change if you think about it. Yeah, it would, I mean... Yeah, I'm not. I'm just making the. the no, I know. I know you're making a joke, but it is yeah, interesting. Know. You know, people are sitting here complaining about all these things that are going on. 
it is within the control of the NCAA and these schools. Are like, all right, you don't like how all this kind of stuff is up yeah, is up to the transfer portal on April seventh. Yeah, right. Why do you have to do it that. then? Like, just just kind of understand what the, it was. Same with football. Like, why do you have? Why are you doing this? Like, there's a there there is a cadence to this. If you want there to be a cadence, go take a page from the NFL. Bring in legal tampering if you want, but let's have like an actual start date to this stuff. It's there yeah, for you, man. Yeah, no, it's a it's a layup, but you know, this is also the. All right. The same Speaking people. Of the Speaking of the trans- after the ball tournament, yeah. So. And this is the part that I'm most I'm most curious about in that what's next for NC State, right? But once once you get past the warm fuzzies of making it to the final four, and I think, and we've spent a good chunk of time talking about the importance of that to make NC State fans feel good again, like understand, hey, nice things can happen here. All right, it it is possible, but now you want to chase it again. And we've seen this before at other places. Heck, we saw it last year at Carolina where there was this thought of momentum from the run that they had in their own march to what happened the following year. And you can remake a roster really, really quick. So I know you wrote about this. Kevin Keats doesn't have the job thing hanging over him anymore because for a variety of reasons, the contract, the run, et cetera. So how do you take that advantage that has been given to you and run with it now. That's the most curious part for yeah. me. No, and it's it's a it's a opportunity and it's a challenge because yep. you have to. This is the platform you've needed for for, for decades. Um, you know, in and look, states the, the the triangle has accounted for six of the last thirty six Final Four teams. I mean, that's an incredible number when you think about it. States in that neighborhood now. Um, I, you know, we don't know for how long, but they have a chance here. They've won an ACC title, haven't done that for. All those things, yes. And I think what we're seeing is, like, I remember, this is in the, the column I wrote today, or yesterday, or whatever day it is, um, <laughs> this, that, you know, I remember being in Denver last year when State makes the tournament for the first time in years. And on the practice day, you know, well, it's quiet in the building and there's not much going on. Kevin Keats is out there making calls to recruits on the floor under the David Thompson banner. So you have these kind of platforms. You have these kind of... Uh, opportunities to, to to leverage, and now you've got the greatest one, right? You're at the Final Four, and we've seen it, right? They got a transfer in the middle of the Final Four, and it's a good player. It's a guy we all know, um, you know, Brandon Huntley Hatfield from Louisville. He was 23 days ago or whatever. He's about to end their season and possibly keeps his career at State and all those other things, and now he's going to be part of the team next year. So if everyone who comes back, who can come back, does come back, they actually have a pretty good foundation for next year. They're like one – you know, DJ Horn type high volume score uh, away from a full mix. But you think about it, you go into next year with Huntley Hatfield, Ben Middlebrooks and Mo Diara mm-hmm. up front, they all come back. And then you've got Jaden Taylor and Michael O'Connell and Paul McNeil's coming in and Brian Pass will be back. And I don't know, Dennis Parker Jr. Look good in flashes. He's, you know, seems to be the kind of guy you might see transfer in a, in a situation like this. But if he comes back, there's, there was something there. So you've got, you know, a core group next year that, We'll have some expectations to be sure, but we'll also have the experience of going through this and bring some of that confidence with them. And the reality is when this team looks back at the Purdue game, and I know you were just kind of digging into this, I think what they're going to, what they're going to see is an eminently winnable game. Mm -hmm. And there's a six minute period of the second half where they miss nine of 10 shots. And of those 10 shots or nine missed shots, about eight of them were the kind of shots they've made in every game over the previous night. Like those were the shots that went in, in the second half against Duke. Those are the shots that went in, uh, in in overtime against Oakland. Those are the shots that went in the entire game against Texas Tech. So it's it's been a shot-making team through this run. So it ran out, and that's what happens against a good team with a guy who can alter shots. So the question is, how do you then, you know, what kind of team can you build that can do the same thing? And I think you, you're you going to be missing a DJ Burge. You're going to be missing a DJ Horn. That's fine, that kind yeah. of organic and all that. But I think when you look at the backbone, sort of the core structure of that team, it's if those all those players come back, you've got a really hardworking, uh, um, versatile core of guys who do their roles really well. So you just you know need to get in the portal and fill some some raw talent around that, and you're in a position where you can win win some games. I think, and then build on that. It's interesting. You the it was a it was a winnable game for NC State, and I gave Keats and the team a lot of credit for powering through adversity in the first half. You know DJ. You talk about shots that have gone in, but they've also seen a friendly whistle. DJ Burns has been able to play his game throughout this entire run. You pick up a bad foul early on. 
you miss, you talk about the six minutes where they can't make a shot in the second half. There was a six minute stretch there where they didn't really have DJ Burns because of the foul trouble. Right. Right. And they, they did their best to stay within arm's length of Purdue. This is where I get to the second half where NC State was able to keep their game plan defensively to force Purdue outside of what they wanted to do. They did start hitting some shots. I think, and again, you were there. I'm watching on TV. I almost think people are going too much in one direction to talk about Zach Eady's game. I thought he altered the game in ways that don't necessarily show up on the scoreboard. They're obsessed with, well, he, you know, he fumbled the ball a couple of times, but he also hit some big shots. Okay. He's, he's not getting necessarily getting blocks, but he's forcing guys that are otherwise comfortable like DJ Burns around the rim, unable to do, he's a big dude. And I thought he affected the game in a way that NC state had not seen throughout this entire run. They finally saw a big dude that DJ Burns could not do what he typically does against. Yeah, and and the other thing people forget in sort of the speedy narrative is, you know, the first 10 minutes of the game, every time they threw in the ball, it scored. Um, and that was a big part of Purdue sort of building that cushion. And the big difference for State in this game as opposed to the others is there have been games where State played from behind. But for the most part throughout this run, you know, State has played with a 5-10 to 10 point lead for most of these games. That's not saying that an excuse or something just that they built those leads and it's much easier. You know, that's a big reason why they believe so much, much easier to play with a lead like that. They never have that against Purdue. They're fighting from behind the whole time. I thought, you know, Zach, you played a Zach, you game rebounded. Mm -hmm. He defended the paint. I mean, they play that almost uh, inverse box in one where it's four guys playing man to man and Zach, you standing under the basket. Um, 30, that your, 30 defensive rebounds in that game. Come that's on. Your, uh, that's your, I thought that was your NBA legal defense rules. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's summer summarized notes. Uh, no, it's and it, and so you 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 know, and then the other part of it is for state to win. I think we all knew this going in. Purdue's guards had to shoot poorly. Mm -hmm. They had, you know they that was look they've done. I mean that's that's when Purdue's Achilles heel when they lose. It's typically because the guards don't play well. I thought state had a huge guard play advantage, especially defensively. But when it came down to it, Lance Jones made shots. You want to talk about the differences between Purdue last year losing to Fairleigh Dickinson and Purdue this year beating NC State to go to the national title game? Lance Jones. Everything else was the same, man. They gave the ball to Zach Eady. Raiden Smith was terrible. Foster Lawyer was terrible. That's Jones. You add one shooter like that, changes everything. So, uh, I, you know, certainly we don't I, a missed opportunity for NC State, but not like because NC State didn't rise to the moment or Zach Eady was too good. It just didn't make shots. It's a make yeah. or miss game, I've, I've been told. I've been told you've got to make shots. Absolutely. Was Sidney, was Sidney Lowe in the house? You know, it's funny. I didn't see him, but that would be... I, would be I know, he's got, I know he had like a weird NBA. I know he had like a weird NBA uh, schedule. I mean, they're wrapping things up, but I didn't know if Sidney Lowe actually made it. And if he was I there, didn't, if did he, he was did there, he, I didn't see he, him. Okay. Oh, everybody else, man, that was Wolf Pack. Well, and that's legends. Actually, and, and when Gilio comes back, I'll, 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 I'm curious his perspective on this because he was a little bit more on the ground, if you will, uh, with a civilian seat and things like that. You, of course, had your typical um, sideline view uh, for a Final Four game. But it sounded to me, and it came across on television, NC State fans made that damn trip. I mean, Un unquestionably. And and look, it's that part of the narrative gets lost a little bit because there were more Purdue fans, right? It's yes. a Big Ten school. You do anything to get out of West Lafayette any time of year. You do anything to get out of Indiana any time of year. So <laughs> the Big Ten schools travel. You know, it's like a bowl game. There were more Purdue fans. They were number one. And state fans were number two. There were mm -hmm. more State fans than UConn fans, and there were surely more. NC State fans than than uh, Alabama fans. So yeah, I you know I thought when both like in the streets around the arena and in Phoenix and in the games walking around, I, NC State showed up. They they were clearly number two to me on on Saturday, um, and I think you know that's what you would expect, right? You're you got a giant Big Ten school, you got a big ACC school, uh, you've got a state school in the Northeast. And you've got a football school. I mean, state should be number two and was. And I, I thought the state contingent took advantage of the moment. You know that when they got to the end of the anthem and they said, you know, in home of the wolf, yeah, that's the loudest one I've ever heard. Um, you know, so they they were in there and and they were loud and and that's in the second half when state did start to sort of close the gap a little before Purdue reopened it. You know, they were they were up and they were going and and. Um, yeah, no, the atmosphere was was much better for the first game on Saturday because there were the Purdue fans and State fans were there. And frankly, the UConn and Alabama fans are 
leaning towards state too because everybody you know they didn't want to play Purdue if they won and all that. So yeah, you don't want to play Purdue. You also understand that state's actually a pretty good story. Yeah, and yeah. I do. I don't know if it's got any further repercussions, but I do think that the way that uh, state fans put their arms around this team and this moment and going to the game and whatnot, I've used the word appreciation a lot. And I hope, my hope is, and it's a fleeting hope, but follow me here. It's not easy to get to the Final Four, all right? It's not easy. And sometimes I think we're a little spoiled around here, and I could see a spoiled-like attitude coming from not all people, but you could tell, based on the reaction to how people were viewing NC State fans and everything else, who's spoiled and who appreciates things. I think you and I were messaging this. There was a little bit of a litmus test for how people reacted to NC State game in the Final Four. Yes, there's rivalry ribbing. Yes, all that stuff is always going to be there. I love that stuff. But there is a line that you cross where you go, man, you're all coming off as spoiled brats with the way people react to NC State being there. The triangle, man. I mean, that's the good, the, the great, and the, the awful of it. But there's no question. I think I was the one who used the word litmus test in our conversation. Yeah. This was like the, the, the Kool-Aid acid test of are you someone who's just here because you just want to spew hate and you have no appreciation for fun, for cool things or fun things? Or are you the kind of person who's like, hey, you know what? I hate these guys and I hate them since I grew up, but this is kind of cool. And if it was us, I would want other people to think it was cool. That, to me, that's the thing about State is it was a likable team. You know, there weren't, you know, there's not, not uh, like a Grayson Allen type. Um, you know, the, the Pete's job narrative, like, Hey man, if you think he's a terrible coach, you should be fired up. Right. Like he's staying at state. Uh, so, you know, the, the, some of the stuff, and, and, uh, but I, I also thought that one, that there was a lot, as much as you and I kind of noticed the negative, I don't say negative, that's such a loaded word as much the, the fans being dingleberries. Um, I thought there were a lot of fans who kind of handled this with a lot of sort of grace. And I think the idea, you know, mostly from, Carolina fans kind of in their feelings about the regional final where one of those teams was going to win. Um, I thought the ones who were like, Hey man, like I hate it that it's these two and not us and blah, 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 yeah. but it's good for basketball. It's good for yep. the ACC. It's good for the triangle. Yep. Like look, we talked about that this with East Carolina football and, and wake sometimes, but you need, it's, it's a three legged stool, man. We need everybody going for this to be what it can be. And that's like, you think about where the, you know, Duke, Carolina and New Orleans, like, ah, oh, amazing. But that's because they're always so good, and it was so strange that it had never happened. Mm -hmm. State can get – I'm not saying State gets to that level. We all know that Duke and Carolina ascended to another plane on some of this stuff. But if State can get back to where it was in the 80s, where it's part of the conversation, and it's competing for ACC titles, and it occasionally wins in Chapel Hill more than once a lifetime, yeah, you know, then you it becomes a different dynamic. It, it, it really is, and I, I hope there are people who can see this I know that there are some of them who can see this. It really is better for everybody. To me, it's better for everyone in the trunk. It's better for UNC if state is good. Nah, it's a, to me, it's a reminder that sometimes we got to go outside good. and touch grass because yeah. we get a little, we get a little too caught up because be, being online makes it super super easy for you to stay connected, right? But the problem with being online too much is that you realize, well, people are online because they want to be miserable most often, not online. Yeah. So some of us can do that in real life. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to help you, Luke. I'm, I'm trying. I'm trying. I think spending some more time around me is I'm, tr I'm trying to get you a little bit less curmudgeoning. But the one thing about being around town, you know, I was out at uh, I was out yesterday afternoon uh, hanging out with some friends and I went to a, a local establishment that doesn't advertise and that's fine. But the um, like there were state fans and they were just like, man, that was great, you know? And then talking to some UNC people, I was like, yeah, that, yeah, that was cool. N nice for NC State to participate. That's the kind of general attitude that I think there's more of than if you spend yeah. too much online, all you're going to see is this negativity stuff. It's kind of like Canes Twitter, right? You'd never know that the Canes were good. We're good if you only or spend made the playoffs five years in a row. Yeah. <laughs> <Never know. laughs> and that's that. Now we're at that point too. That that classic changing of the page, changing of the chapter, the triangle where. Not to say that people haven't been paying attention to the Carolina Hurricanes the last five years, because when you went at the level that they've been at, you know, the two can coexist. We've been doing this long enough now to understand that these things can coexist. People be, can be paying attention to multiple things at once. But now all eyes are on the Canes, Luke. 
And people yeah, are, well, I saw a spitting chicklets clip the other day about like, like, oh, I had my doubts about Carolina, but now I'm all in. And that's what's going to be happening to the Canes team as things wrap up in the regular season. Yeah, I, I, there's a definite sort of change. I, there was a little of this last year, so I shouldn't say definite sort of change, but the national narrative that the Hurricanes are favorites or close to it is a big change. And look, all of this stuff that's happened over the last five years, like the fact that they clinched the playoffs this year in the middle of the NCAA tournament, and everyone's like, all right, great deal, let's go. Um, and there wasn't that sort of release and excitement. It didn't come down to the 82nd game. It didn't come down to the 80th game. You know, I remember being in in Greenville in 2019 when they clinched and what a huge deal that was. And I'm down there in full Zion mode. And it's like, okay, like what's going on and we'll deal with it. But um, I think the difference is going to be the dynamic that, and we did see a little of this last year, but I think it's the trade deadline stuff takes it to another level yeah. nationally, not in the market. Yes. The idea that, oh, the hurricanes are inevitable, blah, 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 and they can't be stopped. And this is going to be sort of a get your flowers first postseason. And the Hurricanes are going to have to deal with that. It's a different dynamic. It's the questions are different. The broadcasts are different. Um, but they're going to go into a first-round series where they're likely going to be extremely heavily favored. And first-round series are tough. It's the hardest round of the playoffs because everybody thinks they can win and everybody's playing their bag off. And that's going to be a test. Like, how do you handle expectations? So Now, can they do it? Absolutely. And the reality is, we're at a point with the Hurricanes where if they don't play for the Stanley Cup, it's a disappointing season. Agreed. And that's the bar as continues to ascend. And just as last year was disappointing, this 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 year that that bar is set there too. And and the thing is, when you look at this team, last year's was a really good team. And there were people who were concerned going into the playoffs. And I think for you know, uh we played so poorly the last month of the season. Uh, you know, there was that sort of look, man, you got like the best team in the Eastern Conference. It's not nitpick the 20 games they played when they were yeah. secured a playoff spot. But this year, that's also not happening. They're going into the playoffs like a, you know, like a train. Um, yes, like the and they're healthy. That's the most, and they're healthy part. So far. That's the most important part. Yeah. And and they're getting goaltended. And there's no questions about it right now. So you put all those things together, it's going to be a very different playoff dynamic. Um, maybe that's good. Maybe that's what this team needs. Maybe it needs to be the bad guy. Maybe it needs to be the, the bully a little bit. Uh, it needs to, it needs to, you know, push people around a little bit and go into the conference finals with that kind of swagger. Uh, if they, you know, play Toronto or whoever. So, uh, but yeah, it's it is funny because I, before I went to Dallas with State and and uh, and Duke, going to State and Carolina, you know, I'm I'm so I called Tom Dundon. You know, I got it's like a mafia boss. You got to get permission to come to his town, and uh, we're I'm like, all right, well, I'll talk to you in uh, a month or so. Like, it's just. For me, when the when the ACC tournament starts, I'm, my hockey brain switches off. Uh, certainly follow along, but now it's yeah. When I get back this week, later this week, it'll be it'll be back into full time hockey till as long as it goes. And at some point, you know, we're gonna have to figure out what to do about the U.S. Open because that's gonna be happening right in the middle of this, which is a problem we all get to enjoy <laughs> if the Hurricanes advance that far. Uh, you and you and Julio can. I'll um. I'll just be in the merch tent looking at the most ridiculous things that have a U.S. logo on. I, I always look to see what the most expensive thing is. Usually, it's some sort of crystal with a logo on it. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. You, you, you want that? You want that bourbon glass set? You want the decanter? That's probably going to be the thing that's the most expensive. You want the, the framed picture of the seventh green? You're going to have to. That, that one, those ones, they get you on those too. The art, you know the. Oh yeah, special, the special edition by Leroy Neiman of. 18th three Michael Campbell on the 18th green at Pinehurst. Yeah, but much like my uh, much like my trip to the PGA Championship at Quail Hollow, I will be looking for the loudest polo they have. Hey man, that's a wide field these days. It is. It is. It the is. graphics it are is an the interesting chart. moment in golf apparel, but that's a different podcast. All right, Luke DeCock, columnist, news and observer. We appreciate it, man. We'll talk to you later. Yep. Big thanks to Hometown Realty for sponsoring Ovias and Gilio. Check them out, myhtr.com. Buy, sell, calculate, know what you need, you know, per month, down payments, et cetera. Because right now, we understand that the home buying market is pretty wild. And you need somebody who can find the house quickly, get you 
into a situation that you understand what you need to do to get the house that you want. These are experts. You don't want to do this on your own. So stick with local, stick with folks that understand this area better than everybody else. And that is Hometown Realty. So check them out, myhtr.com. Big thanks to Whitaker and Hamer for sponsoring Obias and Gilio. Check them out, wh.lawyer. With Whitaker and Hamer, attorneys and counselors at law, they cover a variety of different things. Um, they can represent you for things like traffic violations, as Julio once found out. I got out. I got out with a warning in Gatlinburg, but you know, you know, I was going to call them up if I found myself in an actual ticket situation. But it goes beyond that. Uh, you're looking for uh, business contracts, uh, estates, etc. Whitaker and Hamer can help you with that. Check them out online at wh.lawyer. Joining us on the Heaster Automotive Group Hotline from ABC 11, she is Kate Rogerson. You went from, let me get this straight. <laughs> I open up Instagram and I see that you're in Cleveland. Cool. Mm -hmm. And then NC State loses. I open up Instagram and you're like, all right, um, right, let's see what time I can get to Phoenix uh, from Friday to Saturday for the NC State Purdue game. I went, whoa. And of course, I had to text you. I'm like, all right, let's, let's talk about this journey. So let's walk through how you went from Cleveland to Phoenix and saw both games on time? Um, no sleep is the answer to that question. So <laughs> NC State women unfortunately lost to South Carolina. I looked at my photographer and I'm like, well, I guess the plan that our boss has put in place is going to become a reality. So there was a 650 direct flight out of Cleveland that got us to Phoenix around 830, I want to say. All right. Um, so we booked that. Obviously, you're looking at hotels because we couldn't be homeless in the Glendale area. And we found some Spring Hill Suites about a half hour away. And we just booked it. So we left the arena, did our TV stuff. We get back to the hotel. It's what, like 12, 31 a.m. Mm -hmm. And I thought to myself, I'm not going to bed. Because I still had to do work. And then I had to pack everything up. And by the time I got everything like situated, it was 3 a.m. And we were leaving the hotel at 4 a.m. So... I didn't go to bed, um, slept on the plane. Thank God I can sleep on planes. I did that the whole way. We arrived in Phoenix, the sun is shining and we had a game tipping off in what, like five, six hours. So we mm -hmm. just, we ate breakfast, we went to the arena and it all somehow happened. Um, I was sitting down in the second half of the game and I was just sitting there looking around and I was like, is this real life? Like, did I really just travel from Cleveland to Phoenix. And am I seeing two final fours in two 24 hours and like in the span of 24 hours? Um, so I don't know if it's totally settled in yet. Like we talked to the players and they're like, oh, it hasn't settled in yet. I don't really know if it's settled in for me yet either, but uh, it makes a hell of a story. That's for sure. No, no, nothing but respect because I'm the kind of person that likes to like, how much can I cram into a sport <laughs> day, right? Like Luke DeCock and I have done the thing where we went to three basketball games and a hockey game in one day to see how much we could actually watch. Uh, when I've been uh, to big events like a Super Bowl or a Final Four, like, oh, there's some other event going on, an outdoor game being played at Yankee Stadium. Hell yeah, I'm going to go to that. But two Final Fours in two completely different parts of the country within 24 hours? Kate, salute. Like, that's well done on that one. Who's the I, don't who know. I don't know if the time change helps too, because like it was so much later, but I kept looking. I'm like, okay, it's only one o'clock, but it should be four o'clock. So I have more time. Um, my mom always tells me don't burn the candle at both ends of the stick. And I always do. So I was thinking of her in that moment. I'm like, dang, I'll sleep when I'm dead, but like, I'm tired. But I was just like running off pure adrenaline at that point. So it yeah. was really, really cool. I know some people saw me from North Carolina media. They were like, we're in Justin Cleveland. I'm like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Even, um, Andy Katz, who I've known since college, is a really great guy. I'll see him at games and everything, just catch up. He looked at me. He was like, did you do both? I'm like, yep, I landed here like a few hours ago. He just like shook his head. So um, like I said, makes for a hell of a story and really Love cool it. that I got to experience both. All right. So about the game in Cleveland, because um, I know state fans also had to make a decision too. you know, which trip do I want to go to? And they don't have a, a news organization that's fronting the bill for it, obviously. So, so some some decisions were made. What was the crowd like in Cleveland for that South Carolina NC State game? It was almost sold out. I couldn't believe um, how just Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse just turned into a big melting pot 
of women's basketball fans in the most positive way. Like everyone was just so happy to be there. And I feel like sometimes when you're at games, you can feel the tension between fans mm. and the bad vibes. Uh, uh Everything was like so fun. Everyone was so relaxed. People were like happy and talking to each other. Um, so for the state fans, there was actually a lot of them there. And I kept wondering if only one team made a run, if only the men made the run, only women made the run, how many more fans would have gone to either Cleveland or Phoenix. Um, but a ton of state fans showed out and we crashed the party at the Wolfpack Club's pregame thing across the arena and got to meet some of the season ticket holders and stuff. Um, and there was one family who said they're Wolfpack everything. They have season tickets to everything at Reynolds. They yeah. go to the football games. And um, this lovely woman, she was just like, there is no place I would rather be. She was like, I'm so happy to be here. Of course, the men are also playing this weekend. But she's like, to support these women and watch them make history um, was a goal of hers. So everyone was really happy, really positive to be there. And Wolfpack fans always show up. That is something I've learned in my short time here in North Carolina. It doesn't matter what sport, at what time or where it is, they always show up. They just want to be happy about something, which is what this past weekend really was about. They just wanted to, they they wanted to experience it, which is what a lot of people ended up doing going out to Phoenix. Uh, it's why you know Gilio is going back and forth. What do I do? I'm like, dude, go! Like you got to go to this particular thing. I wanted to stay back here. I talked about this earlier because I wanted to see what this area looked like for a Final Four for NC State. I've seen it on Franklin Street. I wanted to see what this looked like on yeah. Hillcrest Street. It was a really, really good vibe. Everybody was really, really happy. Uh, even though they're disappointed with the loss, I ran into some fans after the fact. And they're just like, yeah, man, it was a great run. Real great memories. And state fans showed out. Like, I, and that That is a big trip. But if you're thinking, hey, I've been waiting for this moment, right? I'm going to absolutely take advantage of it. Even my brother tried to like rework his own work schedule, his his own work travel. Yeah. So that he could make sure that he could get to that game. And he was bummed out. But at the end of the day, he was he was happy that he actually got to experience that sort of thing. But now, Kate, it's hockey time. Get the Celtics hat off. <laughs> it's hockey time. Um, it's almost NBA playoffs time, too. No, okay. no, no. You with the Celtics hat is almost like a microaggression because at this time of the year, casual Miami Heat fan comes out. Mm. And I see that Celtics hat. I can't. I just can't. Well, to be fair, I haven't watched as much Celtics basketball this year as I would like to because kind of busy. we want some other teams in this area to kind of take over my priority on my list. Yes. Um, but yes, Celtics fan. My dad had tickets during the 80s, during the Larry Bird days. So I grew up in a very basketball heavy household. So I guess it only is a perfect storm that I now talk about basketball for a living. Makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Get some sleep. Okay. I'll try. Maybe. <laughs> has, the adrenaline, has the adrenaline worn off? I don't know. I feel like a little bit, but I feel like, no, it's weird knowing that I'm going to be home for more than 48 hours. But I think that's a good thing because my apartment is a mess. I have no food and there's a lot of things I need to take care of. And a lot of people need to call that I haven't really spoken to in the past four weeks. So mm -hmm. maybe, maybe it's a good thing. Good job. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. Get some rest. We'll talk to you later. Thanks, Joe. Mosquito Authority, Pest Authority, helping out Ovias and Gilio. Check them out online at bugsbite.com. Now is the time to bundle and save. Get your outside treatment for mosquitoes. Keep those bad boys in check while you're spending more time outside because it's nice now. But you know it's going to get hot soon. And the mosquitoes are going to be active. But keep them in check with Mosquito Authority. And Pest Authority can take care of the inside of your house, protecting your home. And we have a couple of listeners who have reached out. Shout out to one of our listeners who had posted on Twitter. The Mosquito Authority, Pest Authority truck showed up to their place. They're bundling and saving. We love to see that because if you like this podcast, if you want the podcast to keep on going, you support us by supporting our corporate champions like Mosquito Authority and Pest Authority. Check them out online at bugsbite.com. DraftKings, check them out. 
Download the app today. Use the promo code OG24 to get some bonus bets. I know a lot of you, <laughs> it's funny, last week we did a contest thanks to Matt Davis over at State Farm to give away some Canes tickets. And I had asked, hey, just take a screen grab of your DraftKings winnings, send them to me, and I'll randomly uh, pull somebody out to win those tickets. Luke ended up being our winner. We appreciate him listening, and I know he had a good time at that game, even though the Canes did not win that game. But the Canes have obviously bounced back. But some of some of the screen grabs that y'all sent me, I mean, I'm not jealous per se, but good salute. Some of y'all won big, all thanks to NC State. <laughs> Goodness. Now, I had fun this weekend as I'm kind of experiencing this for the first time because I was not somebody. I, I, I'm, I'm very much a rule follower. I think some people understand that about me. I'm a rule follower when it comes to this kind of stuff. And I was waiting for it to go live in the state before I really started to get involved with this. And I've been having a lot of fun on the DraftKings app. Um, they've got parlays like you wouldn't believe. You can just do simple straight up stuff like the money line, which is where I tend to live. But I do enjoy just putting five bucks down on a built parlay that they have for you. And you know, obviously I looked them over and I'm like, okay, I could see XYZ happening. Like, yeah. I'm pretty sure Sebastian Ajo is going to score a game, score a goal today. You know, given the way the Canes have been playing going into Sunday's home closer, uh, the the season finale at PNC Arena, I'm like, you know what? Against Columbus, I'm pretty sure they're going to come out and put the hammer down. And they had parlays that just kind of matched the things I was looking for. And boom, 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 win twenty bucks, you're good to go. So that is the beauty of DraftKings. They got something for everybody. And right now, when you use that promo code OG24 you will get $200 instantly in bonus bets. So the wait, I know we've been waiting. I know I've been waiting. It is over. People have been all in on this. It's been fun to see people uh, showing me their winnings, their experience with this. It's been a lot of fun. And with DraftKings, the official betting partner of NASCAR, now live, take advantage of those $200 in bonus bets instantly when you use that code OG24. So bet five bucks to get $200 instantly in bonus bets only on the DraftKings Sportsbook app with the code OG24. The crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 877-185543 or visit morethanagame.nc.gov. 21 plus North Carolina only. Bonus bets expire 168 hours after issuance. Deposit and eligibility restrictions apply. Terms at DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook slash NC. NASCAR is not a sponsor of this promotion and used under license. All right, let's get out of here on some Hey Joe. Actually, we don't have a bunch of Hey Joe questions. I, I just want to address one particular type of response from the end of Saturday's Final Four game between NC State and Purdue. Whether it was in the YouTube comments on the After Dark on Saturday night, whether it was some social media reaction on Instagram, Twitter, or threads, some emails, some of the, some of the stuff in the comment section. And it was all related to, whoa, so much for NC State ship being dead, obvious. Oh. Hold up, folks. <laughs> I think there seems to be some misunderstanding or maybe not a misunderstanding, but an overreaction or dramatic reaction to losing a game. Losing on Saturday night, if you're an NC State fan, sucked. And losing if you're the type of person who enjoys schadenfreude, was enjoyable for, for a certain subset of people. As we talked about at the beginning of this podcast, there's an element to this area that I absolutely love and put my arms around because it makes it unique to every other sports environment in the United States. And when you've got three different schools and you also have all the ancillary players outside the triangle that get in on this, it makes it a lot of fun. I love it. But... Let's slow down on this being some sort of example of NC State ship being back. That's just a team that got to a position to potentially win a championship, and they came up short. It happens every single year. Every single year. There can only be one winner. <laughs> there can be only one. And there's a and you know, there's a reason why it's called the road ends here. Only one of y'all is going to walk out of here. The fact that you even got there is a success in and of itself. 
So I'm just going to say this. If you go back to how this all started, where they didn't look good against Louisville in Washington, D.C. to start the ACC tournament, but then they turned things around and beat the teams that they beat, all right? Beating Duke twice, once in the ACC tournament, once in the NCAA tournament. Beating North Carolina to win the ACC championship. Getting bracket luck. I mean, how many times have you heard me and Gilio, specifically Gilio, bring up bracket luck? And NC State got bracket luck to get to the Final Four. Just because you didn't win it all doesn't mean that NC State shit is back. It just shows you, all right, here's the next step. Now you're just like everybody else. Sometimes you just have a brutal loss. Sometimes you just came up short. Welcome to everybody else. That's what I've been getting at. And whether you believe in NC State shit or not is beside the point. You know my opinion on this. If you never believed in NC State shit, well, now you have the prime example to point to when people bring it up. It's like, no, 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 no. You can't say that it exists when this happens. And I think to close today's show, what this all accomplished gets back to what I said at the beginning of this. Don't be that anymore. You know what you can be when things come together. You've, you've experienced this now in your lifetime. So why do you want to go back? Right. And I forgot which NC state player it was, but I think I'm paraphrasing here is that at the end of the day, this run basically gave everybody the idea of, Oh man, this is exciting. This feels good. There's like hope that this can happen again. It's not some weird universal thing that's against us. Look, look what just happened. Right. So that's what I mean when NC state is dead. Everything else that happens after this, man, you just lost. <laughs> like I don't, I don't know how else to put it to not so sound sound so cavalier. You just lost. It happens. Like to every other team that finds, you know, Alabama just lost. They got beat by the better team straight up, right? Caitlin Clark, Iowa, South Carolina. Man, they just lost. It wasn't some weird universal. It, it happens. And that's exactly what happened at NC State. They just lost. Purdue. Locked in. They're on a mission. They're on that redemption tour like Virginia. And they just lost. Simple as that. I know that's hard to process because a lot of people have spent the last, you know, from 1989 until now, you know, from the Chris Corciani <laughs> terrible call up until now, you were like, look at all these things that have happened. Of course it happens to us. Well, now you're just like everybody else. Anyway, that's going to wrap it up for today's show. Julia will be back. We'll talk about his Final Four experience. We'll start getting more into hockey mode. And oh, yeah, the Masters is this week. We'll see you all then. Mm -hmm.